Okay, that was the thesis, which was which which was you know written up according to the proper strictures and and examined. And the viva was a bit scary. If you're doing a PhD, you know, take it from me, it's a bit scary, but it was worth it. And it was a you know um, a great attempt to to persuade my colleagues in the historical profession to factor in this transpersonal historical dimension. Um, but since then, I've watched in growing sorrow that that the ignorance production factories are still operative on this planet you know i mean i was one of these naive little boy scout historians that thinks well look here's the truth i've told it now i've got my phd everyone listen and we'll all live happily ever after no of course not. <laughs> you know people remain competitive argumentative and sophia phobic so after i did the thesis i published this book called sophia phobia which is the which is the opposite of philosoph philosophic. There's a philosophic tendency in humans to love wisdom, but there's a sophiophobic tendency also in us, which is to fear and hate wisdom. And the more you tell some people like this is wisdom, the more they shoot you, uh, crucify you, and shut you up. And I've seen this this struggle, as Freud said, you know, history is a struggle between libido, the love force, and Thanatos, the death force. That's our personal psychic history as well as our collective history. Well, so is all of history. It's a struggle between these two forces, which you could say you could also reformulate as the sophiophobic tendency, the hatred of wisdom, and the philosophic tendency, the love of wisdom. I always assumed and thought, just obviously, everyone would gravitate to the philosophic path, but many people gravitate to the sophiophobic, and they actually make a living from it, which is the kind of military intelligence operatives that run the militarized states which are the superpowers on on earth i hadn't I hadn't realized they were that evil actually um and i'm talking america britain uh you know and and all the other great superpowers that think that they've got the right to go and attack and invade other countries and to distort history to suit their narrative um so we've got fake manufacture of history to prove that Britain had the right to invade Iraq in 2003 because they had, you know, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Do you remember Jack Straw was constantly on the BBC spouting this line? Um, he was a liar, an absolute bald-faced liar. Now, he's a sophiophobe who didn't, doesn't want the truth to come out that he was lying. Um, Tony Blair was complicit in that. And that's a tragedy for the Labour Party because the Labour Party was used as a vehicle by dark forces to do something illegal, which really destroyed the credibility of the Labour Party, I think, for all time in British society. You know, we saw the Labour Party hijacked by, by false narratives. Well, you know, that was just the beginning. Now we've seen the entire uh, British political system in Parliament hijacked by, by dark forces with false narratives. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here, getting a bit worked up, because, you know, it's a bit scary. <laughs> okay, so here's my next little... Uh, so, the thesis took, took us up to 2001, and then, of course, 9-11 happened in 2001, and it struck like a body blow. You know, up until then, I thought history was more or less moving in the right direction. We were going to get peace in my time. We were going to work out the religious wars. I'd set up a mediation service for religious conflict resolution. I'd been to the Vatican, been to India many times, and had friends in all religions. Met the um, Prince of Wales, met the Duke of Edinburgh, went to the Commonwealth Religious Leaders um, Day Festival at Westminster Abbey, and set up the Commonwealth Interfaith Forum for Peace. I was Secretary General of the World Conference on Religion and Peace. I thought, we're getting there, we're getting there. Went to the Vatican with them. I'm going to get peace. And then 9-11 happened. It was like the antithesis of everything I believed in. Where on earth did that come from? And so I, I was initially thinking, well, okay, that came, did it? It came from Osama bin Laden, did it? Oh, that's naughty. What a terrible man. It must have come. And then I watched as the narrative unfolded, and I didn't see any evidence. I asked my American friends, you know, send me any evidence. And they found... They faked evidence. They found passports in, in the rubble. They hid the rubble. They got rid of it as soon as possible. And gradually, I listened as the architects and engineers began to prove that the buildings had not come down with the planes alone, that they were pre-wired. 
and that therefore there's a whole other narrative. And I realised with shock sometime around 2006-07 that we're not being told the truth about this tragic cataclysmic event on which was premised the invasion of Afghanistan and the invasion of Iraq and the whole and all that led from that, which was the entire destabilisation of the Middle East. It was all based on a, a, a half-truth, if not a lie. And of course that, that offends my historical sense as a um, you know, historian. I mean, I'm now living through an era when people are faking truth to a grand extent to justify military capitalism, which is what that invasion was all about. The American corporate sector, en engineered and pioneered by Bush and Cheney and all the others, they sort of took over a flourishing, relatively flourishing, Iraqi state, all there to be pulverized into the ground by sanctions, which were, I think, wrong to have been imposed. <clears throat> and they just tried to trash this, this state, you know, for racist reasons, for religious bigotry. They hated Islam. Uh, a lot of them were in bed with extreme right-wing Israeli Zionists who were thinking, no, let's use the Americans that's like mercenaries to go and clobber these guys. Um, you know, the whole thing stank. And... I didn't realise till I started really looking into it um, as a historian. And the more you look into it, the more shocking it is. Um, so anyway, I did my thing as a historian. I wrote this, which is the first and only two-volume history of 9-11. It, but it's not the definitive work. It can't be. It's the prolegomena to a history of 9-11. I've taken the phrase from Kant. He wrote a prolegomena to metaphysics. He wasn't so bold as to say, I've written the whole you know, how metaphysics works from now on. No, he said, I've, I've written a foreword to what we might want to do with scientific metaphysics. So I've written a prolegomena to what we might want to do with the history of 9-11. We need access to all kinds of documents, archives, emails, telephone traces, all kinds of information that is stored. It is in the world's intelligence agencies. We need to access that if we're going to write a proper history of 9-11. And I've shown in great detail, forensically, painstaking research, what we need to know. I've tried to show what we need, what we know now, and what we don't know, and what we need to know. And I haven't concluded, I haven't said who did 9-11. I've said, here are um, a plurality of possible hypotheses that might explain who did 9-11. I come up with 19 possible explanations. And... <clears throat> um, I weigh them, you know, and uh, it's it was fun writing, but also disturbing because, um, you know, I'm not comfortable with living in a time when we don't know the history of our own time. But then my guide has been Magister Ludi and Herman Hesse. He says, look, to be a historian, you have to be able to confront chaos. You have to live with uncertainty. So, <clears throat> you know, I have to live with the uncertainty of not knowing which of the 18 hypotheses is correct. And there may be other ones I haven't thought of. And that's why I then set up an International Historical Commission into 9-11. It's, it is the first and only historical commission into 9-11. Which I find weird. Why aren't more historians interested in this? They're beginning to be. Some colleagues of mine are beginning to, to put their head above the parapet of the historical profession. Um, <clears throat> my mentor at University College, well, at the Institute of Historical Research, um, ultimately, I never met him, but he founded it, was Professor Pollard, who was a great British historian, and he founded the Institute of Historical Research, where my work was placed when I was doing the thesis, in Senate House, and I don't think Pollard would have accepted the nonsense that's peddled for history by, you know, by fake historians. Um, Albert Pollard, 1869 to 1948, was, was the force behind the setting up of the Institute of Historical Research in 1921. And I want a conference there on 9-11. You know, they can use my book as a, as a founding text, and we can invite all the great historians around the planet from every country to the commission and say, well, you know, what happened here? It's the most important defining event of our era the start of the third millennium, it caused this war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that's only just now ended with the Taliban seizing power again in Kabul. 
20 years after they were kicked out. We've been in this long 20-year cycle. Now, what if it was all based on a lie? What if some forces constructed deliberately a plot to blame Bin Laden and a few, you know, rogue um, <clears throat> Al-Qaeda types to, to then justify this horrible 20-year cycle with trillions of dollars spent and nothing to show for it, completely nothing. Taliban back in power in Afghanistan. And to be honest, I would say good luck to them. You know, I, 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 I sincerely pray to God that they act reasonably. I believe they will. Um, and the world's watching. But, you know, Islam can be an extremely civilized force. And if they draw on the wisdom of the Afghan Muslim traditions, I knew uh, the head of the Sufis of Afghanistan was a friend of mine. There's great sages from Afghanistan. Let them please draw on them as well and fashion a, a kind of Islam that both respects the past, honours the Quran, honours the wisdom of Muhammad and all the sages of Islam, but also honours science and looks forward to the future and can help build a peaceful, tolerant Islam in which used to be called the Switzerland of, of Central Asia. Let it go back to that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I want to share this also. This is Senate House which is the University of London. This is where the Institute of Historical Research is based. And um, if you don't know it, you know, Bloomsbury, check it out. There's a fantastic library, Senate House. This is where I did my research for years. And where I, f I wrote this book, <clears throat> which was a feasibility study into establishing a Centre for Peace Studies at the University of London. Um, I'm still holding the hope that that will happen. I still think it's important. Um, somewhere maybe not in Senate House, but in some house somewhere in Bloomsbury. Um, you know, we need uh, sponsors to, to make it happen because academia is expensive. And um, <clears throat> I did a load of research. This took me two years of work. I was their research development officer for a committee working to establish a, a Peace Studies Institute. And sadly, it didn't happen officially. We weren't given our offices. We didn't have enough funding to... to buy a house in Bloomsbury to, to base it. Um, but I provided the the thinking behind that possibility and I still, then it uh, it left London, it moved to Scotland, and now it's here in France. All the archives that you're looking at here in this book, in this room on Clio, are all the historical archives of the years of working to set up the institute at the university. I did a lot of research on former intellectuals at the University of London and I found loads who were interested in peace. I'm going to name a few. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, one of the founders of the university, coined the word internationalism, profoundly peace-oriented. George Bernard Shaw, he did his degree at London. He visioned a peaceful world. Sir William Beveridge, he founded, um, actually he built Senate House. This structure was, was pioneered under his watch. He was um, Chancellor of... Um, the whole process, and he was director of the London School of Economics. Um, and he also was the architect of the British welfare state, a friend of Churchill, but he was a liberal democrat. He wasn't a conservative. Um, he was a very, very wise man. Lord Blackett, um, who was a physicist, who founded a physics department at Imperial College, he was a peace activist. He wanted physics to be used for peace. He was a correspondent with Einstein, and he was a member of Pugwash, and my colleague, um, um, who replaced him, became head of physics um, at Imperial College, Sir Tom Kibble, who I knew pretty well, he's dead now, sadly, um, was in his tradition. Lord Brougham, Headley Bull, John Burton, Thomas Campbell, Fred Clark, Thomas Davidson, Hugh Gateskill. Even Gandhi did his degree in law at the University of London, right? Uh, Grote, the great historian, Viscount Haldane, who was a Hegelian philosopher and who remodelled the British education system and got the University of London as a kind of constitutional body in British law. Nicholas Hans, a great historian, who inspired me with his study of Freemasonry and the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, ended up as Professor of Education at the University of London, and I used to spend hours studying his work. James Henderson, a professor of history, and history education at the Institute of Education, where I then taught. 
Uh, L.T. Hobhouse, a great sociologist of knowledge, and um, he studied the evolution of ethics and so on, lectured at the LSE. Thomas Huxley, a great scientist. Now, you know, he was a neo-Darwinian, but he was a peace thinker, and his son, Sir Julian Huxley, went on and became the first director of UNESCO. Again, um, these are London graduates. Susan Isaacs, a great educator, um, worked at the Institute of Education where I worked for some years. Um, C.E.M. Joad, a great philosopher, he was into peace thinking. Um, Harold Lasky, a professor of political science at the LSE, likewise. Malinowski, an anthropologist, also at London for a time. Um, Karl Mannheim, professor of the sociology of knowledge at the University of London, at the Institute. Thomas Masaryk, first president of independent Czechoslovakia, a sociologist and philosopher, great intellectual, a peace thinker, a peace activist. Uh, F.D. Morris, a Christian socialist. David Mitrani, who provided some of the groundwork for the ideas of the European Union. Lord Noel Baker, who was a pioneering campaigner for peace and disarmament during the entire 20th century. I have his biography. He, he lived right up until 1982 when he founded the World, Inter uh, the World Disarmament Campaign. And I heard him lecture several times. Um, F.S. Northedge, a great historian. Lionel Penrose. Laszlo Petter, who taught me political philosophy. A um, <coughs> Hungarian historian. Um, L.F. Richardson, who was another great peace thinker. Lionel Robbins, who was an economist and uh, director of the LSE for a time. Bertrand Russell, he also lectured at London. And, and obviously he, he was like the dynamic intellectual for peace in the 60s, a philosopher who utterly opposed nuclear weapons. He thought they were immoral. I agree with him 100%. And he founded CND and he founded Pugwash with Einstein. I never, well, I did meet him actually once in Trafalgar Square, a little boy, he was leading a sit-down demonstration, and my mother pointed him out. I was, you know, we, I was too little to go and go up to him and say, "Hello, Bertrand. I'm Thomas." <laughs> but I'll no doubt see him in the Heavenly Library. Then we have R. H. Tawney, a great philosopher who looked at equality and economics. Toynbee, who was professor, as I said, Evelyn Underhill was a great mystic philosopher, and she specialised in mysticism. What is mystical experience? But she was a deep Anglican thinker who wanted universal peace through mystical access. Sidney and Beatrice Webb were um, intellectuals of a high order, socialists, supporters of the Labour Party, who wanted somehow to improve the social potential for children growing up in London. Uh, Beatrice worked on studying the poor in London. I worked in, in um, Kingsley Hall and worked a lot with the problems of East London, when I was running the Gandhi Foundation School of Nonviolence. The Webbs were titanic figures, and um, Sydney got the education committee through the um, London County Council that then founded the Institute of Education, where I was then employed. Alfred North Whitehead, the great founder of process philosophy, he was a great philosopher who... Um, lectured also at the University of London. Martin White, an international relations expert. Hugh Seaton Watson, a great professor of Eastern European history, whose father worked at the my college, School of Slavonic and East European Studies. Dame Frances Yates, one of my heroines, worked at the Warburg down the road from my office, and I never met her, but you know, I sat at her feet many a time reading her amazing books on the Rosicrucian Enlightenment and the esoteric side of history. And that fits in with my notion of transpersonal history. There's a transpersonal dimension to history that we can't ignore. And it shouldn't be just secret. You see, the dark forces use secrecy. We should use public light. I always say that, um, you know, secret intelligence is a, is a misnomer. There's no such thing as secret intelligence. Intelligence should be shared and given away, and that's what educators do. I'm, an, I'm a believer in public intelligence. Okay, I want an enlightened world. I don't want a world full of scary spies all spying on each other and, and dropping bombs and accusing each other and defaming each other and doing cyber warfare. No, that's a dark world. That's a world taken over by demonic forces. 
I want a world of, you know, public intelligence. And so <clears throat> Tony Weaver, who inspired me, he was a great educator at the Institute. Dr. Jagdish Gundara, an expert in multicultural education, inspired me. Rex Andrews. Um, you know, I have a soft spot also for Prince Albert, who was the husband of Queen Victoria, and who was a learned man who helped found Imperial College. He was a great savant who founded a lot of the institutions that made British international, uh, intellectual you know, advancement possible. British Institute for the Advancement of Science he was president of. And Imperial College came out of his fevered brain. I mean, he was a true thinker, old Prince Albert. Unfortunately, he died young. I mean, it's a tragedy in British history. Had he lived, World War I would never have happened. Um, and, you know, to me, World War I was a catastrophe for Britain and for Europe and for the world. And then Dr. Zaki Badawi, my mentor at the Muslim College where I taught, he was a great Muslim scholar and historian. And, you know, he was had degrees, PhD from the University of London, but also from Al-Azhar University. Now, my argument is this bunch, they're the founding mothers and fathers of an Institute of Peace Studies at the University of London. They're my line managers. And, you know, their descendants intellectually are still active. That's why we should get together still a centre here in Senate House or the Environs for Peace Studies. And I will work for that till I die. You know, And if anyone wants to help me and contact me and loves the University of London like I do, please get in touch and, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have a serious chat about that. Um, <clears throat> OK, a few more things to share and then I'll um, surrender to the, to the Lords of Time. So this is an amazing book, Global Encyclopedia of Historical Writing. This is the sort of dictionary and reference book I've, you know, based my work on. Um, I'm interested in global historical writing. Like, what do Vietnamese historians say? What do Thai historians say? Uh, what do, you know, Buddhist historians say? Chinese, Japanese. Uh, they're all in here, right? I mean, I just discovered something absolutely amazing about Thailand. I mean, I, I ought to have known this, but... The um, Ayodhya Kingdom um, used to be based north of Bangkok. It was a civilization for about 400 years, flourishing, highly sophisticated. It was Buddhist, but they were, they were drawing also on Hindu ideas. Their capital, Ayodhya, was called after Ayodhya in the time of Rama. Um, their kings were often called Rama. They had a highly sophisticated literature. They had arts to a high degree dance, music. The Thai court at Ayutthaya was to die for sophisticated. French visitors turned up in the 1600s, British. Um, they were on the world trade routes. Uh, Persians used to come at the court. And they were, they were intellectually like literate in many languages and many traditions. They even had like a Theravadin tantric tradition going. They, they had absorbed things from Tibet and from the Tantric Mahayanist tradition, which they absorbed into the culture of um, Ayutthaya. Okay, so paradise to die for. And then suddenly, in 1767, <clears throat> a Burmese army appears. The Burmese don't like the Thais for reasons I, you know, just can't fathom. It's like xenophobia, like the English don't like Europe. You know, it was propagandized. The Burmese hate the Thais, let's invade them. So they send a huge army of, I think, 40,000 people, they then besieged the capital, Ayutthaya, for 14 months, and then they sack it. And not only that, they mercilessly slaughter everyone they can find, men, women, children, and then they burn the archives, <clears throat> all the libraries. 400 years of archival work goes up in smoke. All the literature, all the poetry, all the historical records of an entire kingdom, Ayutthaya, go up in smoke by a, a ransacking Burmese army of, of complete nutcases. Sorry, but, you know, it's, it's, this is the thing about history. <coughs> you learn these tragedies. And then, only a few months later, the Burmese army entirely withdraw, having destroyed the whole thing, because the Chinese are meanwhile attacking Burma, because the Burmese had taken on more than they could chew. They were attacking Thailand and China at the same time. Bad mistake. And so, <clears throat> so they leave, having utterly destroyed a civilization. 
Well, what happens next? Okay, a few people get together and rally a resistance. A few people of the Thai army that still survived. And they, they move south 40 miles and they found a new city as a new capital which grows into Bangkok. And that is what Bangkok is. And the, and the culture of the Ayotcha kingdom was transferred into what is now the Thai kingdom. And there's been a direct line of monarchy descent ever since the 1770s as this new state then took, took formation. It was in it, but all its archives had been burned to bits. All its, a lot of its literature had gone. I mean, can you imagine that? It's like, let's say, a, I don't know, some crazy army of Icelanders suddenly attack London, destroy the British Library, smash the entire of Bloomsbury. They, they burn down Senate House. They destroy the library, smash the London Library, destroy um, <coughs> the uh, Imperial College you know, library, and, and the whole thing is left a pile of ashes and rubble. London's gone. British civilization wiped out. And then a few survivors, like, move to Brighton and restart it. <clears throat> I was just, I mean, I only discovered this. I did world history, and I ought to have known this, and I probably learned it at some point, but it was brought home to me vividly because I was researching this recently, and... You know, history is full of these tragedies, and yet the incredible resilience of the Thai people, who then rebuilt their civilization, and now Thailand is a to die for amazing country to go and visit, uh, with, you know, high culture and art and beautiful scenery. So, yeah, I think, so we will get through this, but I do want my Peace Studies Institute, please, in London, um, and I do want us to learn the lessons of history and not completely, completely sort of repeat them. Okay, I want to share this book from France because, of course, I live in France now. I speak French. I've worked with French historians. And here's a historical dictionary of the academicians of Lyon. I was visiting Lyon, and it's a beautiful city not far from here. Older than Paris, it was at one point the capital of, of Romano-Celtic Gaul, and it has amazing institutions, it has a library that is world class, it has museums that are to die for. It's where the Emperor Claudius was born. Um, you know, if you have anything planned for a tourist thing, go to Lyon and, and spend a day or two, well, three or four, going around its incredible resources. And one of the things it has is this academy, the Academy of Lyon. <clears throat> and here are a list of all its members between 1700 and 2016 and it's over a thousand pages and these are the intellectuals of Lyon many of whom are historians or educators or scientists and it gives their details and of course the contemporary academicians have written all this up with painstaking detail they were around at the time of the French Revolution they were thinking what liberty equality and fraternity actually mean they didn't agree with Robespierre and the sort of violent turn of the revolution but they agreed with the general idea they quite liked Napoleon who who respected Lyon came to visit and said go for it guys you're a clever city and you know so I've absorbed also as much as possible French intellectual historical scholarship and I'm still working on that there's so much to do right I want to share this, another passionate um, field I'm interested in, which is uh, Iranos, an alternative intellectual history of the 20th century by Hans Thomas Hackel. And it's a study of these conferences that took place every year in Iranos in, um, in Switzerland. They're called the Iranos Conferences. They were founded by um, a woman called Freiba Kaptein, who actually spent part of her childhood in Bloomsbury, her dad was a roving Dutch genius inventor uh, who became quite wealthy, and she inherited it. And with her money, she set up in 1933 the Uranus Conference, which was to study spirituality and, and psychology east and west. And she, she was close friends with Jung, uh, Zimmer. Um, they invited you know anyone who was anybody in, in European intellectual work at the time, looking on transpersonal issues, deeper issues. And they had essentially annual or biannual conferences ever since. And this tells the history. And these are some of the greatest minds of the 20th century. 
and it tells their story. And of course it's called a secret or alternative history because it's hardly ever talked about in the conventional historical establishment. Who aren't interested in the deeper meaning behind history, what I call transpersonal history. They're interested only in the kind of the battles and who won the battle. Not like why did the battle happen and how can we stop the next one, which is what we're interested in. It took place at Ascona, uh, overlooking Lake Maggiore in Switzerland. And I, I've been to Switzerland several times. I love it. Nietzsche also used to go to Sils Maria and he was inspired by the Swiss landscape. And what's not to love about a conference on the meaning of history taking place in Switzerland, right? Um, Louis Massignor, one of my heroes, used to go. Um, he's a great Sufi expert who wrote on Al-Halaj and helped set up Syria. And, you know, he was a French advisor when Syria was created. I really want the wars in Syria to end. I want there to be a peace and reconciliation for Syria, as I'm sure Massignor would. Um, and even Paul Tillich, the great theologian, went to speak at, um, at uh, Ascona, at the Iranus conference in 1936. So, yeah. And Suzuki, the great Zen scholar, was there. Um, Egyptologist Eric Hornung, um, you know, an immense panoply of, of thinkers. And as a historian, I'm interested in the history of ideas primarily. And I think that that history of Iranos needs to be better known. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to finish soon. I want to share, this is my mother's autobiography, Essays on Life. This is personal family history. I even get a footnote mention. <laughs> but my mother was really active in the peace movement in Britain, in CND. She set up uh, Sussex Alliance for Nuclear Disarmament. Um, I'll read from the book. Through the Sussex Alliance for Nuclear Disarmament, Brighton started to make links with peace activists in Dieppe. The British Trident missile system, based at Faslane, had its French counterpart, Triomphant, based at Lille Longue in Brittany. Hiding nuclear weapons under the seas was giving people a false sense of security. In order to alert them to the danger, in 1989, under the slogan Ocean pour la paix, a flotilla of French yachts, the biggest owned by the Council of Montreuil, sailed along the channel from Dieppe to Cherbourg, then across to Southampton and Brighton, holding meetings at each port. At a big send-off in Dieppe Harbour, there was an escort of rubber, rubber dinghies from Brighton Sea Action. Bruce Kent stood on the deck of one of the yachts waving a broom to sweep the channel clear of nuclear rubbish. When President Chirac started nuclear tests again in the Pacific in 1998 on a visit to Dieppe with a Brighton group of councillors and citizens, I and some others gave out leaflets against the tests along with the French. Later, there was a mayoral reception in true French style with speeches interspersed with wine and canapes. The mayor spoke warmly and at length of all the Brighton-Dieppe Council exchanges for peace. And at the end, he came to the most important link of all. I was totally overwhelmed by surprise to be handed a medal giving me honorary citizenship of Dieppe for my peace work. Okay, that's my mother's personal memory of her work for peace. And, you know, bless her, she deserved it. She was a tireless campaigner for peace, and she worked particularly on the anti-nuclear dimension. And so we have this coming uh, October, a big conference in Barcelona. The International Peace Bureau is meeting for a, a conference, which many of my friends will be at, and I'll probably hopefully attend on Zoom. I don't think I'll get there in person because of, the pandemic stuff. Um, and also we have the Faslane demonstration on the International No Nuclear Day, which is September the 26th. In, she mentions Faslane. Well, you know, that struggle is still going on. This is why Scottish...